All right, guys, we're going to jump right into it because we have a lot to cover tonight. But that's all right. You'll survive because we're talking about a great topic. And that topic, of course, is sex. A lot makes a lot of people uncomfortable, but I love talking about this topic. In fact, when I was a youth pastor, one of my favorite things to talk about with the youth group was sex and what the Bible says about sex. And one thing that I would do as a youth pastor is, you know, you gather all these teenagers together and they're all nervous and, you know, talking about sex is awkward. And I said, okay, what we're going to do is I'm just going to rattle off about a dozen words that are going to make you uncomfortable and make you be red in the face and you're going to giggle so you can get that all out of your system so then we can actually talk about this seriously. And then I just went through a whole, you know, bunch of words, all the body part names and sexual positions just to get that out of their system so we could actually have a good, healthy conversation about that. I won't do that for you tonight, but you guys are mature adults. You're ready for this. So we're talking about sex tonight, and I want to give you kind of a preview for how this lecture is going to flow. So there's a sense in which we're going to do this in two major steps. The first thing I'm going to do is make an argument without appealing to Christianity or the Bible. I'm going to argue that sex is only morally good inside marriage. And when I use the term marriage tonight, I'm meaning by that term um, marriage between one man and one woman. So whenever I use that term, that's what I mean tonight. So the flip side then is true, if this argument is correct, that therefore then sex outside of marriage is morally bad. So I'm going to be making that argument first without appealing to the Bible or Christianity. And then the second half of the lecture, I'm going to argue that if Christianity is true, and I believe it is, then Christianity gives us more understanding of why sex is only morally good inside marriage and why it's immoral outside of marriage. So first, let's do the first part. I'm going to argue that marriage is immoral uh, outside of marriage without appealing to Christianity or the Bible. Now, I'm going to begin in making this argument with a basic moral principle or guideline, sometimes it's called. And this guideline is just a general principle that helps us to know if something is good or bad. So when we're trying to know if something is good or bad, and it's not always easy to do so, when we're trying to evaluate a situation or an action to see if it's morally good or bad, one thing that's helpful to take into consideration is the consequences of that action. Does this action cause people pain and suffering, or does it cause people to flourish? Now, I'm saying tonight, I'm starting out with this principle, that this is a good guide to help us know if something is good or bad. I use the term flourishing. You might not be familiar with that term. Sometimes this principle uses the term pleasure or happiness. But I don't use those terms because I think both of those terms can cause a lot of confusion. I mean, when you think of pleasure and happiness, you usually think of uh, fun. So, for example, uh, eating donuts for every meal might make you happy, but it's probably not going to make you flourish as a human being, right? Or getting drunk every day might give you a lot of pleasure, but over the long run, it's not going to cause you to flourish. So I choose this word very um, specifically because I think it captures what we're trying to communicate here. Does an action cause people to flourish? Of course, one of the key parts of this then is what does it mean to flourish? And we don't have to get super specific with that tonight. I think most of the time when you see a flourishing person, you recognize it. Somebody who's uh, doing well, they're becoming a better person, they're productive, they're stable, they're selfless, they're becoming more caring of others and thoughtful of others. And it's usually pretty, pretty easy when you see the opposite. 
right? When you see somebody who's addicted to heroin and how it's ruining their lives, it's pretty clear that they're not flourishing as a human being. So flourishing, we don't have to get super specific tonight in defining. I think it's usually pretty obvious to folks. Now, those of you who are familiar with ethics or meta-ethics might be wondering, am I proposing utilitarianism or maybe even natural law with this moral principle? And the answer is no. No. I'm not proposing utilitarianism. This isn't natural law because I'm not saying that flourishing makes something good or that pain and suffering makes something bad. This is a very important distinction. We talked about it at the beginning of the semester between epistemology, how we know things, versus ontology, what makes something good or bad. All I'm saying tonight is that this is a principle that's useful in helping us know what's morally good or bad. I'm not claiming that this is what causes something or makes something to be good or bad. So starting with this basic moral guideline, here is the argument. Premise one, which is just this guideline I've been setting up. A good guide to know if something is morally good or bad is if it causes flourishing or if it causes pain and suffering. Premise two, sex inside marriage causes flourishing, not pain and suffering. And premise two, would state the flip side of that, that sex outside of marriage causes pain and suffering, not flourishing. And in this context, I mean, I think you pretty much know what I mean by sex outside of marriage. That would include sex before marriage. Uh, that would include adultery, having sex with somebody who's not your spouse when after you're already married. This would include uh, homosexuality, but also would include masturbation and pornography. So all of this forms, all of these forms of sex are outside of marriage between one man and one woman. So if the first two premises are accurate, the conclusion follows. Number three here, therefore, we can conclude that sex inside marriage is morally good and sex outside of marriage is morally bad. So that's my basic argument that I'm going to be making tonight, arguing for um, sex inside marriage is the only morally good form of sex. And again, I'm, I'm, appeal I'm making this argument without appealing to Christianity or the Bible. I want to give you guys uh, some time to chat about this argument. Do you agree with your argument? Disagree? Why? And then... If you disagree with it, or if you want to play the devil's advocate, that's helpful sometimes. If you're going to reject the argument or disagree with the argument, what premise would you attack or disagree with? Or if you think both of the premises are correct, maybe you see an error in the logic that flows to the conclusion. So evaluate the argument together, break up into small groups as best you can with social distancing real quick, and I'm going to give you three minutes to chat about it. Go ahead. All right. Well, as you can imagine, uh, people who disagree with this argument usually will go after premise number two, right? So premise two would be the premise that we would want to spend the most time defending. And I think it's appropriate to do so. We need to defend premise two here. And I think a very strong case can be made for premise two that um, sex outside of marriage causes uh, pain and suffering. Now, I would say, and I think the argument can be made very well and very compelling, that sex outside of marriage causes pain and suffering not only for the participants. Well, let's start there. I think for the participants, it causes pain and suffering. I can't tell you how many young women um, that I've worked with as a pastor who have been, uh, their lives have been ruined in various ways by men who were using them basically for sex before marriage. 
and all the troubles that that caused emotionally, relationally, financially, in their family, all sorts of, of problems. So there's a sense in which, you know, we often make arguments against abortion, and unfortunately the women probably feel like they take the brunt of that. But based on my experience and working with, with young men who uh, use young women for sex, I think just as much blame needs to go on the young men who are, you know, oftentimes encouraging, if not pushing, uh, their girlfriends or young women into sex, which results in pregnancies that they weren't expecting or wanting. So not only does it cause uh, pain and suffering for the participants, it causes pain and suffering for the existing family. And what I mean by that is uh, parents, grandparents, siblings, people in the family already, as well as future family. So the children that are produced, I think a case can be made, and I'm going to give you guys some good resources to continue to go down this path of defending premise two, but I think a really good case can be made that the best environment for children to grow up in and really flourish is within the context of a marriage between a man and a woman. So you're not only thinking about the participants, their pain and suffering or flourishing, existing people, existing family members, relationships, but also the future children that are produced from these things, and society as a whole. I think, especially with the resources I'm about to give you, a good compelling case can be made that society as a whole most flourishes or best flourishes when sex is enjoyed within marriage between one man and one woman. In fact, people, governments, and societies have recognized this for hundreds, thousands of years. That's why most governments promote marriage and want to provide incentives for people to get married because it provides that stability not only for the children but for society at large. We've talked about some of the different ways that sex outside of marriage can cause pain and suffering, but there's emotional uh, pain and suffering that often comes from it, relational, physical, uh, financial is one aspect of pain and suffering that's often overlooked, but just a marriage, a man and a woman provides a financial uh, security or financial situation that these other arrangements often don't. I mean, just think about how messy things can get in terms of inherent passing on inheritances, uh, divorce proceedings, how messy those are. So a lot of these things can just create havoc. Adultery, having children with other people outside your marriage, well then where does the money go? Who gets what? It can be a huge mess, with then, which then often causes emotional and relational pain and suffering as well. Now, oftentimes I'll have people when I'm, you know, having this friendly conversation with folks and they disagree with me, they'll often say, well, I've had sex outside of marriage and I didn't experience any pain and suffering, or I know so-and-so and they've had sex outside of marriage and then it doesn't cause them any pain and suffering. First of all, that's anecdotal. Uh, second of all, I don't believe it, <laughs> that it caused no pain and suffering for anybody. And thirdly, for every story like that I hear, I can provide a hundred stories where sex outside of marriage has caused tremendous pain and suffering. It's kind of like, again, the heroin example, and I'm going to use that a lot tonight. But you might hear somebody say, look, I used heroin or I use heroin and it doesn't cause any pain and suffering. First of all, I don't believe it. <laughs> And second of all, for every person who claims that using heroin doesn't ruin their lives, I can give a hundred, probably a thousand examples of how heroin and addiction to heroin has ruined somebody's life, okay? But we don't want to just build our case with anecdotal evidence, an experience here or an experience there. What is helpful to really defend the second premise is to have some substantial research 
not just a story here, a story there, but an incredible amount of research. And that's what I'm going to provide for you tonight. I want to move on to other topics. I don't want to spend the whole evening defending premise two because there's a lot of other things I want to cover. But if you want to continue to go down this path, or if you want to write a paper on this issue, you get the opportunity to do something at UNL to write on this topic, I wanted to give you two resources. And these are just uh, co collections of research, um, academic research that has been done on this topic. So the first one is called, What is Marriage? Man and Woman, a Defense. This was originally published in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. So in other words, this wasn't written by, you know, the local pastor. This was done at a very high academic level. And it's quotable when you do academic research. I mean, it was originally published in one of Harvard's academic journals. So take a look at some of the authors. There's three authors who put together this collection of research that's been done. The first person has a degree from Oxford uh, as a Rhodes Scholar, and then a PhD from Princeton and a law degree from Yale. Second one, Ryan Anderson, degree from Princeton, PhD, Notre Dame. And probably the most impressive credentials is the third author, this gentleman, Robert P. George, um, is a professor at Princeton and Harvard, visiting professor at Harvard, served on the President's Council on Bioethics, presidential appointee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights, and a former judicial fellow at the Supreme Court. Now, don't hear me wrong, I'm not making an appeal to authority. I'm not claiming that their research or their collection of research is correct just because they have great academic credentials. That would be an appeal to authority. I'm not doing that. My point in telling you their credentials is to show you that they, this can't just be dismissed. If you're going to challenge premise two, you've got to deal with the research. And this is well done, very academically respected research that has to be dealt with if you're going to challenge premise two. The second resource is called the Family Portrait. Also, again, a collection of data, research, and public opinion on the family and marriage. I wanted to read to you that um, an endorsement on the back of the book. This was written by Robert George, who was one of the authors of the other book. But take a look at what he wrote here as an endorsement for this book. This is the professor from Princeton and Harvard. He wrote, the sexual revolution promised liberation. It has produced instead carnage measured in broken relationships and wounded or ruined lives. Exactly what I've been arguing in premise two. Sadly, its principal victims have been the children, especially children of the poor. So the family portrait documents the dire condition of marriage and the family in our contemporary society. At the same time, it points the way to a recovery of moral sanity. So I think these two resources are, would be very, very helpful to you. And this is where you'd have to go. We're going to stop with this argument for the night. But if you want to continue down this path, your job would be to defend premise two. And those are two resources to do that very well, I believe. Now, another objection to this argument goes like this. This is something that might have came up when you guys discussed for a few minutes. But here's another common objection. It's common today for people to believe that morality is based on our individual subjective desires. Often this is associated with an argument for um, the moral acceptability of homosexuality or maybe transgenderism. But the argument, if you want to put it in more of a formal argument, would go like this. Premise one, if someone has a desire for something, then fulfilling that desire is morally good for them. This almost sounds like the subjectivist's argument in the debate a couple weeks ago. Premise two, 
Some people obviously desire to be the opposite gender or have sex with someone of the same gender. Therefore, if you're putting this argument together um, as a premise, premise, conclusion, therefore, number three, it's morally good for those then who have that desire to become the opposite gender, transgenderism, or to have sex with someone of the same gender, homosexuality. So I want you to get together with your groups again and discuss this argument. Do you agree or disagree with it? Why or why not? And if you're going to challenge it, how would you challenge it? What premise would you go after? Or maybe you'd go after the logic of the conclusion. So get together in your groups and I'll give you guys three minutes. Here's the argument. I'll put it up. You guys chat about it. All right. Well, I overheard a lot of your guys' comments and uh, I think you're on the right track. I would definitely challenge premise one here. And I myself, I've never heard a compelling argument for believing that something is morally good merely if I desire to do it. I don't think a good case can be made for that premise. At least I've never heard a good case. Now, I will say I understand why people think that way, okay? And the reason why people think that way, the, the reason why most people affirm premise one is because this is the message which has been preached in Western culture over the last 200 years, these type of messages. You should follow your heart. You need to be true to yourself. You need to be authentic to your true self. You should define yourself by your desires. You are what you love. That's who you are. These are the messages which have been preached in our Western culture over the last 200 years. So I know why, I know that's why people believe premise one, but I don't think a good case can be made for it. We're going to take a little detour tonight because I think it's helpful to understand more why people think this way. And it's helpful to understand why people think this way. And to, to understand that, we need to take a look at the history of Western ideas, sometimes called the history of Western philosophy. So I'm going to, we're just going to do this very quickly in a few minutes for a more <laughs> detailed um, trip down the history of Western philosophy. You can take my philosophy class, which I'm teaching this semester, and we're putting all the lectures up on YouTube, on my Convincing Proof YouTube channel. But tonight I'll summarize it in just a few minutes. In fact, I think I can summarize it in just one slide with a couple pictures on it. This is a slide that I didn't create. I actually found it on the internet. But I think this slide, in a humorous way, captures the history of Western philosophy. It kind of pokes fun at the three major eras of Western thought. So I'll put it up and you take a look, see if you can find the humor in uh, all three of the eras that kind of poke fun at. Take a look. I really like this picture because it's teasing, right? It's kind of making fun at all of these eras. And you've probably heard these terms before. They're not unique to me or this picture that I found on the internet. Most people use these three terms, pre-modern, modern, and post-modern, to talk about the history of Western ideas or Western philosophy, right? So one way that I summarize these three eras is like this. In the pre-modern era, People thought truth was something that came from up there, right? Mostly from God. Most of the pre-modern thinkers or philosophers were Christians. Not all of them were. Think of like Plato and Aristotle. They also saw truth as coming from up there somehow in a transcendent realm, some form of a deity. But definitely the Christian philosophers argued that truth, ultimate truth, like the meaning of life and such, came from up there. In the modern era, though, our culture shifted to think more that truth, meaning to life, other important truths, can be found out there in nature. And we could access that truth in nature out there through our reason and science.
But then we've shifted, I would say, starting in the early 1800s, our culture has completely shifted now to the point where we're at today. And that is where most people believe that ultimate truth, the meaning of life, so on and so forth, can be found in here, internally, in our hearts. And let me explain, let me walk you through how this happened. How did we get here to this postmodern point in our culture? Well, modernism, you're very familiar with, right? The scientific revolution, the enlightenment in the 1700s, right? In modernism, there was an extreme emphasis placed on rationality, our reason, and objective truth. One of the things that came out of modernism was the belief that science was the only way to know truth. And at the beginning of modernism, there was a lot of optimism that through our reason, rationality, science, exploring, discovering nature, that we were going to figure everything out, including the meaning to life, the purpose, ultimate truth. However, modernism concluded with something vastly different than that. As modernism attempt began with that optimism and that hope, it concluded that there is no meaning to life. Modernism as a movement eventually came to the conclusion that there is no meaning and purpose to life. That all we are as human beings are mechanical robots that have been programmed via an accidental arbitrary process of evolution. And there is no meaning and purpose out there in the world, in the universe in our lives. Things are, life is meaningless. Now, if you don't believe me that that's the conclusion that modernism came to, let me give you two quotes real quick. These are modern thinkers, and they, this, they are concluding, they're expressing the conclusion of this movement known as modernism. The first quote comes from a guy by the name of Jacques Mano. He was a French Nobel Prize winner one of the co-founders of molecular biology, and this is him summing up the conclusions of modernism. Anything can be reduced to simple, obvious mechanical interactions. The cell is a machine. The animal is a machine. Man is a machine. The universe is not pregnant with life, nor the biosphere with man. We at last know that we're alone in the unfeeling immensity of the universe, out of which we, human beings, emerged only by chance. Our, his, man, mankind's destiny, purpose is nowhere spelled out, nor is his duty. So the conclusion of modernism is that there's no meaning or purpose to life. Here's another quote. This is from Richard Dawkins, probably the most famous atheist in the world. Now, he's not a postmodern thinker. It's not like everybody is postmodern, right? You understand that? There's still pre-modern thinkers alive and well. I'm a pre-modern thinker. And there's still people who think in a modern way alive and well today. Richard Dawkins is one of them. But he also summarizes this conclusion of modernism. Look, we're survival machines, he said. Robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. This is a truth which still fills me with astonishment. I've known it for years, but I never seem to get fully used to it. Imagine that. Well, because modernism crashed and burned, uh, because it began with this hope that we're going to figure things out, the meaning of life, purpose, through science and reason and rationality and nature, because it started with that hope, but then it ended, crashed and burned with these dead ends, that's what gave birth to the postmodern movement. So in response to these conclusions of modernism, postmodernism was born. Because think about it for a moment. I mean, how crushing of a blow is that? that there's no meaning and purpose to your life. You're just here by accident and nothing you do ever matters. You're just a robot that's been programmed by evolution. There is no such thing as love. It's just a chemical reaction that nature selected for because it led to greater chances of survival and reproduction for your genes. 
Love's just a chemical reaction. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty hefty blow. And so in response to that, people reacted, as you can imagine, against that and proposed these postmodern ideas. Basically, they said, look, if there's no truth and meaning that comes from up there, you know, there's no God, there's no transcendent realm, all that exists is the material, physical universe, and there's no meaning out there, we've shown that with science, right? There's no meaning in nature, then really they were so desperate for meaning and purpose, the only place there was left to turn was in here. And so you can kind of have sympathy for the postmodern mindset because it's like, sometimes I think of it as like a cornered animal where they had nowhere else to go. They just become desperate. So even though we think it's kind of silly, especially if you're a pre-modern thinker like I do, you think it's kind of silly to view truth and meaning and purpose coming from inside of you. Really, they had nowhere else to go after the dead end of modernism. And all the postmodern movements have been preaching this message, as I said, for the last 200 years. Beginning in the early 1800s, these are some of the key postmodern movements or thinkers. And there's been several of them, obviously, over the last 200 years. But it's these thinkers which have really moved our culture into the postmodern mindset that it is in today, where we think that truth, including moral truth, comes from within. Now, the vast majority of people don't even know who these folks are, aren't familiar with these movements. Most people don't read the philosophers themselves. But what happens in a culture is that the artists pick up the ideas from the philosophers and then communicate it to the masses, the hoi polloi, us, normal people, is communicated the ideas from the philosophers are communicated to us through art, all forms of art. So when I teach this in my philosophy classes, my favorite form of art is movies. I love watching movies. And so I show through movie clips how this message is taught to us from day one. If you've grown up in this culture, you've heard these postmodern messages thousands, if not millions of times, not only in movies, but our TV, our songs, our literature, et cetera, et cetera. And I could go through, I won't for the sake of time tonight, but I could show you how this is preached in Star Wars. I mean, just think of what Obi-Wan taught Luke to trust his feelings. Not his sight, not his reason, but his feelings. And Harry Potter, we're taught that truth is in our heads, not an external reality. In Guardians of the Galaxy, the big conclusion at the end of the second Guardian of the Galaxy movie, the big climax of the movie is that we're supposed to learn to use our heart to defeat the bad guy, not our head. The Matrix, one of my favorite movie series, um, teaches us to irrationally believe in love even though there's no evidence for it. Just choose to believe that love is real anyway. One of the best examples, and I, you might have seen me show this clip before, is from the movie Interstellar. Christopher Nolan is the director. He calls himself a postmodern movie director. He's the one who did the original, or the, the Batman trilogy in the early 2000s. And so Christopher Nolan I think makes it very clear his postmodern messages in his movies. But there's a five minute clip right in the middle of Interstellar which sums it up beautifully. And then some people feel like I exaggerate, but I often say this about Disney movies. The vast majority of Disney movies teach us to follow our heart. And if you don't believe me, there's a Disney movie coming out in a couple weeks, a new version of Black Beauty. Um, and actually, the little girl from Interstellar plays, I mean, she's grown up now, I think she's 20 years old, but she's the main character in this Black Beauty. It's a little bit of a callback connection there. I thought that was interesting. But anyway, if you watch the trailer for this new Disney movie coming out, one of the taglines that shows up right in the middle of the trailer is a black screen with white words, follow your heart. <laughs> so I'm not exaggerating. This is explicitly 
the message of most of our Disney movies, to follow our heart. And we've all been raised in this culture, so we all grow up thinking this way, that truth, including moral truth, is found in here, and our desires, passions, feelings, that truth, beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. That's a very postmodern message. Now, we've all grown up with these ideas. We've all been trained to think this way. But what I encourage young people to do is to really think about the things that they've been taught. We've all been taught certain things by our parents, by our culture. But eventually, you grow up and you, you have to evaluate. Are the things that I've been taught by my parents all correct? Are the things that my culture has taught me actually true? And I think you should evaluate these postmodern messages to see if they really are correct. So here's another discussion question for you after our run through of the history of Western philosophy. If you were going to challenge this idea that meaning and truth comes from within, including moral truth, how would you challenge that idea? Let's say you're having a conversation with somebody and they're convinced that they should follow their heart, that truth Purpose, meaning, morality all comes from inside of them, from their heart. How would you lovingly, respectfully challenge that idea? All right, I'll give you three minutes. All right, I'll, I'll tell you how I lovingly challenge people um, who believe this. And again, you know, especially as part of Rosh Christi, we want to do this in a loving, respectful way. But I think it's, it's actually very helpful and loving to people to challenge them on this. They, they might get offended, they might take it very personally, but if we do it in a gentle way, if we're good listeners when they're talking, I think we'll get opportunities to challenge people on this. Because I think it's, it's important to do so. I think this is a grave mistake that people make to think that just because they have a desire to do something, that makes it a morally good thing to do. I think that's very dangerous. I think it's a huge mistake. I mean, just think about it for a second. We all have many, many, many different types of desires, don't we? I mean, sometimes we desire to be the center of attention. I know I do. Sometimes we desire to help other people in need. Sometimes we have the desire to lie, especially when telling the truth is going to be embarrassing, right? Sometimes we have a desire to fight for justice. Sometimes we have a desire to put other people down to make ourselves feel better. We all have various different desires. And I think it's appropriate to recognize that some of these are good desires and some of these desires are evil. In other words, just because we have a desire to do something doesn't automatically make it morally good. Because we all have a mix of good and evil desires, desires themselves can't be the determining factor. Now, I believe in moral intuition. I think that is a very real, true thing, that moral intuition is something that we have and that we can use to try to figure out what's good or bad. But our desires or our passions, our feelings, can't be the determining factor. And those are different than moral intuition anyway. But because we have good and bad desires, those can't be the determining factor if to something is morally good or bad. I think external reality is a much more reliable guide. That's why, you know, I talked at the beginning when I made my argument about flourishing. Flourishing is something that we can appeal to about objective reality, right? It's something that we can look at, something that we can study and see if an action causes flourishing or if it causes pain and suffering. I don't think we should conclude that something is good just because we have a desire to do it. Oftentimes, we should resist our desires. Oftentimes, our desires are selfish and evil prideful. And so we should fight against our desires often. I'm going to just give you a few examples. I'm sure you're thinking of some already. Oftentimes it's morally bad to indulge our desires. Think about anger, right? It's often 
good and healthy and morally appropriate to resist our anger desires, our angry desires for murder or hurting someone. Our desires for junk food. You know, I joked around about donuts, but just think about it. If we don't resist our desires for junk food, we, you know, become obese. Our desires for laziness, we need to fight and resist those because then we can't provide for ourselves or provide for others if we're indulging in our lazy desires. Our envious desires will lead us to steal or take things that aren't ours or try to achieve things through ill-gotten means. So often the morally good thing to do is to control and discipline our desires. So take all of that, everything that we've just talked about here the last couple minutes, and just apply it in the sexual realm. Now I affirm that we all have different sexual desires. I mean, you've probably seen the studies or read the books about human sexual desire, and it's very uh, diverse. You know, there's all sorts of different desires, fetishes. You know, some guys really like feet for whatever reason. I mean, we joke around about it, but there's a whole different, um, there are different sexual desires that people have. But the point is, some of our sexual desires are morally good, and some of them are bad. Now, I'm going to give you a list of bad sexual desires, and some of them might gross you out, but it's just a scientific fact that some people, maybe some even in this room, have these desires. Okay, this has been studied, this has been shown. Some people have these different sexual desires. I won't go through them all. You can see them on the PowerPoint. And some of these might seem very strange to you, especially if you don't have those desires. They may seem very odd. But the fact is, some of us find ourselves having these desires. We might not understand where they come from. Oftentimes, our sexual desires are very mystifying. I mean, is it because of our DNA? Is it because of our genetics? Our culture, our habits, our upbringing, nature, nurture, brain chemistry, hormones? Are there spiritual influences? Is it psychological or a combination of all the above? I don't know. Oftentimes our desires, including our sexual desires, are mystifying where they come from. But the fact is, some of us find ourselves having these type of desires. My point is that just because someone has a certain sexual desire doesn't mean it's morally good. In fact, I think most all of us would recognize that some of these sexual desires are morally bad and should be resisted. Now, I want to make a distinction here tonight that I think is really helpful in our thinking, okay? And the distinction to make is between our desires and our will. Some of the older philosophers would call it our volition, uh, the thing about us that makes choices, okay, our will. So it's important, I think, when we're trying to reflect on what we are, who we are, what's going on inside of us, to make a distinction between our desires and our will. In other words, our choices in response to our desires, okay? I'm here to tell you tonight that you are not a slave to your desires. You can choose to act on your desires, and you can choose to resist them. And I would encourage you know, people who have some of these desires to resist them. And I think it's appropriate, and I have a lot of respect for folks, and I've worked with folks who have had some of these desires and hate them and resist them and fight against them their whole life. And so I don't judge them necessarily for having the desire. My judgment of them or my view of them comes from their choices in response to their desires. Does that make sense? I think it's important to keep that distinction in mind. Sometimes, especially when I was a pastor, people would ask me, maybe if they struggled with some of these desires, Will I ever change? 
Will these desires ever go away? And I don't know the answer. I can say, just from experience, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But my encouragement to folks is always to focus on your choices, not your desires. Don't define yourself, don't define who you are by your desires. Define yourself by your choices that you make. So, can somebody change? Think about it this way for a second. I think this is very, very helpful. Consider an example of somebody who desires to do heroin and, and, and is a heroin addict, okay? And it ruins their life. I think we could all agree that for the most part, heroin ruins your life. So let's say you've got this person in mind, they've taken heroin, they're addicted to heroin, they desire heroin, and it has ruined their life. But one day, they decide they want to change. And they begin resisting their desire for heroin. And they get help, and other people come alongside them, and eventually they overcome their addiction. Let's say 10 years down the road, they're doing well, they've got a good job, they've got close friends, family, supportive environment. They're flourishing, so to speak. However, they still desire to do heroin. Almost every day, several times throughout the day, they have a desire to do heroin, but they don't do it. Now, has this person changed? Well, you could say their desires haven't changed, but I think it would be wrong to say this person hasn't changed. I think this person has changed radically because, again, I'm viewing them or judging them, if you will, considering them based on their choices, not their desires. That's why I think it's so important to make this distinction between our desires and our will, our choices. So my encouragement would be to you not to look down on people who have these desires. So take pedophilia, for example. Some people find themselves with that desire. And I would encourage you, I think it's appropriate to call those desires evil. We could acknowledge those are evil desires. But some people find themselves having it, and they fight against it, they know it's wrong. They wish they didn't have them, and I have a lot of respect for people who might have evil desires who fight against them. Because again, I'm viewing them, judging them based on their choices, not on their desires. As I said, desires are very mystifying. Why do we desire some of these things? I, I don't have the answer for in a lot of situations. So let me switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, transgenderism. This is a big part of this discussion of sex and gender. Sometimes it's referred to as gender dysphoria. Historically, that's what it was called. And I want to acknowledge, first of all, just acknowledge the fact that some people experience a disconnect between their gender anatomy, what's on the outside, and the gender that they feel they are, what's on the inside. And I've never heard a compelling argument to conclude that what's on the inside is correct and what's on the outside is incorrect. That's kind of the default nowadays, right? But I've never heard a compelling argument to conclude that. Again, because I know the history of Western philosophy, pre-modern, modern, and post-modern, I understand why people think it's the inside that's correct. But I'm concerned that because of the influence of postmodern philosophy, people automatically assume the outside is incorrect, and so they do sometimes irreparable harm to their bodies trying to fix the outside. And I think it's just as reasonable, in fact, I think it's more reasonable to conclude that it's the inside that is, is incorrect. Given, as we've talked about already, the unreliability of our internal desires. It just seems to me, from experience and arguments and evidence, that external reality is a more trustworthy guide in the vast majority of cases compared to our internal feelings and desires. So 
If we have desires that don't line up with external reality, more often than not, external reality is a more reliable guide than our internal desires. Now, I do want to mention one thing before we move on, because this has come up a lot when I've had conversations with folks, and I think it's an issue that confuses some people and causes them to think that they're the opposite gender or that they should be the opposite gender than what their anatomy and chromosomes say they are. So let me just address this issue and then I'll have another objection or another argument for you guys to discuss together. So this is the point, this is the issue I want to raise when it comes to the issue of transgenderism. The, though there are some objectively real gender distinctions, obviously women can become pregnant and men can't. That's the most obvious objective example of distinctions. There are a lot, of, I want to affirm that there are a lot of gender distinctions that are merely cultural, cultural constructs, cultural traditions. Things like, you know, women wear pink, like decorations, like gossiping and like dressing up, whereas men like blue, <laughs> pickup trucks, uh, sports and drinking beer, right? This, this isn't built into objective reality. These are just cultural traditions. In fact, I got a funny story to share with you how one of my seminary professors discovered this. One of my seminary professors was a missionary for years in, uh, it's, it's a Slavic country, so Eastern Europe, uh, part of Russia, or part of the old USSR, one of the Slavic nations. And he was there for years, but one of his very first experiences was uh, he met a group of guys as friends, and he was trying to, you know, share the gospel, share Christianity with them, and they all wanted to go swimming together, and he didn't have a swimming suit. And so he went and bought a swimming suit very quickly and uh, bought a blue one, thinking that, you know, blue is manly. It's, you know, it's a good swimming suit to wear. And when he showed up at the beach with his new friends in this other culture, this other country, they teased him and laughed at him all day for wearing blue. Because in that culture, it was a feminine thing to do, to wear blue. Doesn't that seem odd to us in Western culture? But it just proves my point that there, a lot of these things are cultural. They're cultural constructs, they're traditions that we've developed over years, who knows why. And sometimes it can be difficult knowing what is a cultural construct, colors, activities, and what is something that's really built into external reality. Sometimes it's easy to know, right? I mean, liking pickup trucks, that's just, you know, a cultural tradition here in the West, at least, that guys like that. The fact that only women can have, can get pregnant and have babies, that's obviously built into objective reality. That's not a cultural tradition. But other times it can be, be difficult to know. All this to say, what I've experienced, you know, as a pastor is that some people, for example, I'll just pick on men. Some men have come to me saying, look, I, I am more interested in what culture says is feminine. Same thing can happen with a woman, right? They're more interested in things that their particular culture says is more masculine. And because of that, it causes them to mistakenly think they should be the other gender. And so I work with them and I've shown, you know, people that, look, this is just, these are just cultural things. Even if you enjoy what our culture says is more feminine, that doesn't mean that you are a woman or should become a woman if you are a man. There's also things we want to recognize about average differences, right? This bothers some people and you just have to work through it, help them understand that there's just common averages between men and women that's, that are built into objective reality. It's just a fact that on average, men are taller and have greater upper body strength. It's just a fact, on average, women, girls do better in school and have greater color vision. And being uncommon, I, I struggle with trying to find the right word here, being outside the average, extremely, being a short man, or being a very strong woman, being outside the norm, outside what's common, doesn't make you the opposite gender or doesn't, shouldn't be a reason 
why you should want to be uh, the opposite gender. Okay, these are just things that some people have to work through, and so I wanted to mention them here before we moved on. Okay, another objection, a lot to cover tonight, I told you. Another objection to the argument that we began with, you often hear that as long as sex is between consenting adults, then it's morally okay. So if you want to put it into an argument, here you go. Premise one, as long as something is done among consenting adults, then it's not bad. There are situations where consenting adults have sex outside of marriage, adultery, before marriage, whatever, uh, homosexuality. Therefore, situations where consenting adults have sex outside of marriage is not bad. So get in your groups again. I'll give you three minutes to discuss this. What do you think of this argument? Do you agree, disagree? How would you challenge it? If you're going to challenge it, a premise, the logic. So here's the argument again, and uh, go ahead and discuss it for three minutes. All right. Well, the first thing I want to do is uh, affirm that consent is a very important factor to consider when you are evaluating a situation to see if it's morally good or bad. Okay, consent is very, very important. In fact, I would say that sometimes, in, in some situations, situations, consent can actually be the determining factor that makes something morally good or morally bad. Ben, when we were talking about this earlier in the week, had a great example of this. And that would be the um, situation of you taking my car right now. If I didn't consent to that, <laughs> that would be stealing and morally bad, right? But if I gave you consent, if I said you could take my car and gave you my keys, then it would not be morally bad. So consent does play an important role in ethics, and I want to affirm that. However, I want to also make the case that consent by itself doesn't and cannot make something morally good on its own. I'll give you some examples. Even if there's consent, prostitution is still morally bad. Even if there is consent among adults, a 45-year-old man having sex with his 25-year-old daughter incest, consenting adults, is still morally bad. So consent by itself, even though it can be a very important factor, can't by itself make something morally good. In philosophy, if we were going to do this in a philosophy class, we would say it more technically than this. In philosophy, we could say something like this. Consent is a necessary but not a sufficient condition. Consent is necessary, just think about the sexual realm for a second. Consent is necessary, right? You need to have consent in a sexual situation, otherwise it's rape, and that's morally bad. So consent is necessary, but by itself it's not sufficient to make something morally good. As I said, there's examples where even though there is consent, we would all recognize it's not morally good. Prostitution, incest, I'm sure you can think of others. So just because there's consent between adults doesn't necessarily make it good. Sometimes you hear people say, well, we should be free to love who we want. A couple things in response to that. Um, first of all, I think it's important to distinguish between love and sex. Okay. I mean, I would, my understanding is that within marriage, sex is part of that love, but there's a lot of loving relationships between family members and friends that don't include sex. So we have to make that distinguish. We have to distinguish there between love and sex. Secondly, I'm not arguing for anything to be illegal tonight. Okay. My, my argument has nothing to do with legality or freedom. Okay, all I'm talking about tonight is whether something is morally good or bad. 
whether something should be illegal or not is a different conversation. And I'm happy to have that conversation. But tonight I'm merely talking about what's immoral or moral, what's good or bad. Some things that are bad should be illegal, like rape and murder. But there are other things like, you know, telling white lies, silly example. We would agree is morally bad, but most people wouldn't say that white lies should be illegal. So I'm not going down that path tonight. All right. Well, we're done with the first part of the lecture. <laughs> now we're going to move on to part two, but this is going to go more quickly. I want to transition now to considering if Christianity is true. So far tonight, I've been making a case that sex is only morally good within marriage. So any form of sex outside of marriage between a man and a woman is morally bad. I've been making that case without appealing to uh, the Bible or Christianity at all. But now I want to consider if Christianity is true. I believe Christianity is true. I believe that God exists, that Jesus is God, and that the Bible comes from God. And we have a lot of good reasons and evidence to believe that Christianity is true. In fact, that's what we do at Rosho Christi, is we mostly present those reasons and evidence. So tonight I want to consider if Christianity is true, and I believe it is, then it, Christianity, gives us more understanding here as to why sex is only morally good inside marriage. So the first thing I think that Christianity helps us understand better is that it explains why causing pain and suffering or flourishing is a useful guide to know if something is bad or good. Remember at the beginning of this lecture I said that I was only presenting it as a useful epistemological guide. I wasn't making an ontological claim. I was just saying it was a useful principle for us to know if something is good or bad. I reject, as you guys probably know from the beginning of the semester, I reject the idea that that makes something good or bad. But I affirm it can be a useful guideline to help us know if something is good or bad. So according to Christianity, what makes something good or bad? I think Christianity, if it's true, and I believe it is, helps us understand why this is a good moral guide for us. So what makes something good or bad if Christianity is true? Well, let me present my argument very quickly for this. My first premise, I would argue that something is morally good if it resembles God. God is the ultimate standard of good and evil. So something is good, in particular, I would argue, if it resembles the love between the members of the Trinity. That's what makes something morally good. If it doesn't resemble that love between the members of the Trinity, then it's morally bad. God's the ultimate standard. Doing something loving, as a human being to another human being, doing something loving resembles the love in the Trinity. It resembles God. Number three, Causing other people to flourish is a loving thing to do. And generally, for the most part, causing others pain and suffering is not a loving thing to do. I say generally because you know the silly examples of getting a root canal or getting open heart surgery. You do cause some pain and suffering, but it's ultimately for them to flourish, right? So that's why I say generally there. So conclusion there, number five, therefore causing others to flourish is morally good. Causing pain and suffering is morally bad. And if Christianity is true, it helps us know why that's the case. That's what makes something good or bad. And then that informs us why the guideline that we started out with can be useful to help us know if something is good or bad. In other words, both Christianity and utilitarianism can use this guideline because both positions agree that flourishing is good and suffering and pain is bad. We just disagree, Christianity and utilitarianism, consequentialism, disagree about what makes the action good or bad. So I want to transition now more to 
what I titled the lecture, and that is how the Bible celebrates sex. Because I think we need to ask the question, okay, if Christianity is true, if God exists, if Jesus is God, if the Bible comes from God, then what does God have to say about sex? And you guys, most people watching, I'm sure, are very familiar with all of the verses and commands that say that sex outside of marriage is morally bad. So I'm not going to cover those verses. And you can look those up if you're not aware of them. I think everybody is aware of those verses. So it's very clear and obvious that the Bible uh, says that sex is only morally good inside marriage. In fact, I think those verses that condemn mar uh, sex outside of marriage are so often um, given and preached on that many Christians and non-Christians actually think the Bible is against sex, is against sexual desires. In fact, um, a lot of our art, by art I mean movies, TV, songs, often use that worn out stereotype of churches, pastors, priests condemning sexual desires. You see that in movies all the time. In fact, there's a new movie out on Netflix right now. Uh, this is the girl from Stranger Things, and uh, she plays a high school student at a Catholic school, and she is one of those individuals that, in the movie, has very strong sexual desires. But the movie, I can tell just from the trailer, is using that old worn-out stereotype that the church and the religious leaders are condemning sexual desires, and so it's just an old, worn-out stereotype. And sometimes, you know, we, we perpetuate the stereotype because that's, as a church, as pastors, that's all we talk about are the commands against sex outside of marriage. So you might be surprised to hear that the Bible actually celebrates sex and celebrates and encourages sexual desires. And I'm going to show you that tonight <laughs> so you have more opportunities for some red faces tonight and to be embarrassed. These are the rated R sections of the Bible. All right, I'm going to show you tonight. To prove to you, and I want to spend quite a bit of time on this, because I think a lot of people, non-Christians and Christians, are surprised how much the Bible actually celebrates sex. In fact, when I was a student at UNL uh, in the mid-90s, eons ago, I took an English literature class. And in this class, we were supposed to bring some of our favorite poetry to read to the class. And I brought some excerpts from the Song of Songs in the Bible and read them without telling anybody in the class where they were from. And we're going to read some of those verses, so get yourself prepared. I read these verses in front of the class and the professor, and they were all, you know, into it totally. You can imagine college students. You are college students. Oh, this is erotic. This is scandalous. Where is this? Is this, romantic? is this from the Romantic era? So on and so forth. They name it off. I said, actually, no, this is from the Bible. <laughs> and it just blew their minds. Even the professor was like, what? Where? Is it condemning these things? I said, no, it's celebrating these things. So let's take a look. I want to prove to you that this, the Bible celebrates sex and sexual desires. Take a look, we'll start in Proverbs here. Bible says, uh, drink what, this is a lot of innuendo, obviously, drink water from your own cistern, water flowing from your own well. Should your springs flow in the streets, streams of water in the public squares? They should be for you alone and not for you to share with strangers. Let your fountain, you know what that means, be blessed and take pleasure in the wife of your youth. As a loving doe, a graceful fawn, let her breasts always satisfy you. Be lost in her love forever. Now, you might be thinking, I can imagine somebody already thinking, well, okay, yeah, maybe the Bible celebrates uh, male sexuality, but never female sexuality, right? Well, obviously, if you think that, you've never read Song of Songs. 
take a look at this. This was Song of Songs is kind of set out almost like a play uh, between a man and a woman and others. Uh, the audience is another big character in the play. So you'll see that even in the Bible it's laid out, okay, the woman is speaking now, the man is speaking now, and here is a situation where the woman is speaking, talking of her lover or soon-to-be lover. Oh, that he would kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. The fragrance of your perfume is intoxicating. Your name is perfume poured out. No wonder the young women adore you. Take me with you. Let us hurry. Oh, that he would bring me into his chambers. The audience, you know, encouraging this, and some people put God even in the audience. We will rejoice and be glad for you. We will praise your love more than wine. Also in chapter 2, written by the woman, or the woman speaking here. Like an apricot tree among the trees of the forest, so is my love among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banquet hall, and he looked on me with love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apricots, for I am lovesick. His left hand is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. Young women of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and the wild does of the field. Do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. So as much as there is a celebration here of sexual desire and anticipation of sex within marriage, there's also a, a warning here not to uh, awaken or fulfill these desires until the appropriate time. The man's perspective, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride, I gather my myrrh with my spices, I eat my honeycomb with my honey, I drink my, mine, my wine with my milk. Eat the audience, possibly God in the audience. Eat, friends, drink, be intoxicated with love. We're going to continue. The woman, my love is fit and strong, notable among 10,000. His head is purest gold, his hair is wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, washed in milk and set like jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice, towers of perfume. His lips are lilies, dripping with flowing myrrh. His arms, rods of gold set with topaz. His body is an ivory panel covered with sapphires. Legs are alabaster pillars set on pedestals of pure gold. His presence is like Lebanon, as majestic as the cedars. His mouth is sweetness. He's absolutely desirable. This is my love. This is my friend, young women of Jerusalem. Audience, where is your love gone, most beautiful of women? Which way has he turned? We will seek him with you. This kind of becomes the, the drama or the intrigue of the story. My love has gone down to his garden, to beds of spice, to feed in the gardens and the gather the lilies. A lot of innuendo here, obviously. I am my love's and my love is mine. He feeds among the lilies. A couple more. The man, how beautiful are your sandaled feet. Another one of these foot guys, right? The curves of your thighs are like jewelry, the handiwork of a master. Your navel is a rounded bowl. It never lacks mixed wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat surrounded by lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like a tower of ivory. Your eyes like pools in Heshbon by the gate of bath Rabin. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon looking towards Damascus. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel, the hair of your head like purple cloth. A king could be held captive in your tresses. How beautiful you are and how pleasant, my love, with such delights. You can't get much more vivid than this. Your stature is like a palm tree. Your breasts are like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree and take hold of its fruit. May your breast be like clusters of grapes and the fragrance of your breath like apricots. Use that mouthwash. Woman, the last one will be done. Uh, talking of her either husband or soon-to-be husband. Your mouth is like fine wine flowing smoothly for my love, gliding past my lips and teeth. I belong to my love and his, desires is, his desire is for me. Come, my love, let's go to the field. Let's spend the night among the henna blossoms. Let's go early to the vineyards. Let's see if the vine has budded, if the blossom has opened, 
if the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes give off a fragrance, and at our doors is every delicacy, new as well as old. I've treasured them up for you, my love, if only if I could treat you like my brother, one who nursed at my mother's breasts. Then I would find you in public and kiss you, and no one would scorn me. In that culture, it was inappropriate to uh, have any public displays of affection. Um, I guess it was okay if it was your sibling, but if romantically it was, it was uh, looked down upon. So she was, she was saying, man, I, would, I almost wish that you could, were my sibling, then I could hug you and kiss you in public. I would lead you, I would take you to the house of my mother who taught me. I would give you spiced wine to drink from my pomegranate juice. His left hand is under my head and his right arm embraces me. Young women of Jerusalem, I charge you, do not stir up or awaken love again until the appropriate time. So I read all these verses, and I know I put you through that embarrassment, but I want, especially for those watching online, to combat all those old, worn-out stereotypes that Christians, Christianity, and the church is are somehow against sex, against sexual desires, because that's just not true. So there's two questions. How are we doing on time? There's two other things I want to cover tonight. It's 9 o'clock already. I know we're going a little bit late tonight, but you guys are doing fine. Two other things I want to cover, but I want to let you guys discuss them first. All right, so if you can stand the embarrassment after reading all those verses, get back together in your groups and uh, discuss these two things. If you just want to focus on one of them, that's fine. But discuss these two things, uh, these questions, and then I'll come back and I'll wrap it up uh, by discussing these two things. All right, go ahead. All right, well, I started here with this first question, um, this classic joke. You've probably heard this before. I've heard a lot of atheists make this joke or just really sometimes it's just an exasperation, right? That, boy, it seemed like God has played a, a cruel trick on us. He gave us these intense, oftentimes overwhelming sexual desires and then told us not to have sex. <laughs> first of all, We've seen already from the Bible that that's not the case at all. In fact, the Bible of God celebrates and encourages sexual desires. However, I think it is appropriate to ask why, or wonder maybe, why did he give us such strong sexual desires? I mean, it seems like it's probably, if not one of then, or if not the, then at least one of the strongest desires we have in our life are these sexual desires, and they can you know, be very overwhelming, especially, you know, when you're going through puberty and the hormones are starting to work for the first time and it's overwhelming. So why, why could it be the case that God would give us such intense desires? A little bit of speculation here. Um, and this is what we do in theology. We try to, we start with the Bible, start with uh, special revelation and general revelation and try to understand things as best we can from what God has given us. So a little bit of theological spec speculation here tonight. But I, I would say that one possible reason that God has given us these very strong desires is that there's a, there's a caricature, uh, maturity-building benefit from learning how to control and discipline your desires. There's some real benefit from learning how to discipline and control your desires. So it might be the case, and I think it's reasonable to conclude, that God gave us some of these desires for us to learn how to control. I mean, most uh, folks recognize that one of the key measures of maturity in folks is, to, is that they're able to deny themselves immediate pleasure, immediate desires, the fulfillment of their impulses uh, immediately to, de to deny those in order to reap more longer-term benefits. And most people acknowledge that's a key indicator of maturity. You've probably seen that classic video that's shown in a lot of psychology classes or talked about in psychology books of the experiment they do with children, right, where they put them in a room 
it's like torture, but they put them in a room with uh, one marshmallow and they say, now I'm going to leave the room and you can eat that marshmallow if you want to. But if you don't eat it after so many t- 10 minutes or so, I'm going to come back and then I'll, you can have three marshmallows. It's torturing these kids. So, you know, they put a video camera in there, and it's so funny. You can go on YouTube, and not now, but later you can go on YouTube and watch these videos, and some of the kids are just tortured. It's just, they want that marshmallow so bad. But those children, you know, little kids, who have the ability to resist that desire for 10 long minutes, right, then are rewarded with three when the person comes back. And the kids who are able to do that that's a key indicator of their maturity. And these experiments have been going on for decades now and shown how those with that ability, that maturity, um, that, char- that type of character, are mu- do much better job flourishing as human beings. So learning how to control our desires and impulses is a key aspect of our maturity. And this is you know, what we congratulate and celebrate in people, right? We often celebrate people when they accomplish things. So you think about uh, Olympic athletes. Well, what, do they ha- what have they done? I mean, I can guarantee you, I've never met an Olympic athlete, I don't think, but I can guarantee you they don't get up every morning wanting to do 10 hours of training. I'm sure there's a lot of desires they have for donuts, for sleeping, for hanging out with their friends and family, that they deny themselves in order to accomplish longer-term goals. And we acknowledge that and reward and celebrate them for that. Same thing with academic degrees, right? You as students know this. You have to deny your immediate pleasures. And those who can't, they don't do as well. So this is a key part of maturity and growing up, is learning how to discipline and control our desires and, you know, focus them into appropriate things, or at appropriate times, if you will. So in the sexual realm, learning how to focus all of your sexual desire, focus, control, and uh, moderate your sexual desires and focus them on your spouse is, I think, a learning and a growing experience of maturity. And so, you know, I would say this is at least one reason why God would give us some of these intense desires. I also think, you know, sex is intended to be pleasurable. I was so thankful that when we got married almost 25 years ago, one of my friends gave me a book called um, Sex, Intended for Pleasure. Gave it to us as a couple. It was a couple who had gotten married before us. But... um, so there's a lot of, you know, purposes of these sexual desires. Fulfilling them, obviously, is very pleasurable procreation. A lot of purposes of sex and desires. But I think this could be one of them as well. All right, the last thing will be done tonight. Why did God create two genders? I think another way to ask this question is, why didn't God just create everybody the same? Same height, same weight, same strengths, same abilities, same personality. Why did God create us differently? I think one of the reasons He did this, again, this is some theological speculation, but bear with me. I think one of the reasons God created us differently, including different genders, is to unify us so that we would come together and learn how to work together, to depend on one another's strengths to serve each other with our particular strengths and abilities as genders, as personalities, as people with different skills. I think this is one of the reasons why He created us differently. Unfortunately, what often happens is that our differences drive us apart, and that's our fault, not God's. And you see this all the time, right? Jocks make fun of nerds, because stereotypically jocks aren't as smart and nerds are, so they make fun of them for being nerds. Nerds make fun of jocks because, you know, Stereotypically, nerds don't, aren't, don't have the athletic abilities, so they make fun of the jocks, right? You see this all the time. Men make fun of women for their weaknesses, differences. Women make fun of men for the things that they do, dumb or differences. So oftentimes, our differences drive us apart, but I think the intention, God's intention, was the opposite. That our differences should bring us together. Just think about a football team for a second. Very simple example, right? On a football team, you don't want everybody the same. You want some people who are big, bigger, and strong. 
You want some that are smaller, but faster. So you want diversity on a football team, basketball team, and that's actually a good thing. And instead of the bigger ones making fun of the smaller ones because they're smaller, or the faster ones making fun of the bigger ones because they're slower, instead, what should they do? Be thankful for each other's differences and congratulate them for their particular strengths and abilities and work together as a team. And that's what a good coach will do to get them to work together, serve one another, complement each other. And that drives unity. That drives teamwork and brings people together instead of driving them apart. And I think it should in our lives as well. And I think that's one of the reasons he created us as different genders, to foster that unity. Another reason, I think, is that it resembles the Trinity. So in the Trinity, in God, you have unity and diversity. You have three unique, diverse persons unified as one. And if God created us to reflect him, God created us in his image to resemble him, this is just one way that we do that. We're different individuals, we're diverse, different strengths, different genders, different abilities, but yet we become unified, we come together. So this unity in diversity resembles God, resembles the Trinity. You see this even at the very beginning, right? If the Bible really is true, and I believe it is, then God created Adam and Eve and what did he do immediately? He said, it's not good for Adam to be alone. So he brought them together to become what? One flesh. So you got diverse, two in this case, people brought together to become one. An illustration, a resemblance, a reflection of God. Unity in the midst of diversity. So I think one purpose of marriage, one purpose of genders, even one purpose of sex is this unity in the midst of diversity. Diversity actually providing the opportunity for unity. And that's what sex, in, that's one of the things that sex accomplishes in marriage, is to bring people together. I mean, besides just the physical aspect of becoming one, obviously there's some innuendo there. But what sex can do within a marriage is bring people together, not only one bring a man and a woman together not only physically as one, but also emotionally. The way that I like to explain it is like with children telling secrets. You guys all had best friends when you were little, I'm sure, and you told each other secrets. And the secrets themselves probably weren't all that important, right? What was important is that you shared something private and secret with someone, and then they kept the secret. And that experience really brought you and your friend together. It bonded you, sharing those secrets, if you will. And there's a sense in which sex does that for a married couple, as it brings them together intimacy, not only physically, but emotionally, as they do these things in secret, private, together, that only they know about. So if you want to continue going down this path, um, this is a great little book. It's not hugely deep or philosophical. Just a great little Bible study book you can do with a group that helps you understand how the Trinity, in a sense, helps explain everything. Uh, marriage, society, the church. Um, I think most every part of creation is an image, a reflection of the Trinity in some way, shape, or form. Well, since this is the last Rasha Christi of the semester, I wanted to especially since we're talking about Christianity, and I'm concluding this lecture, right, assuming that Christianity is true. I, I, I don't do that as an assumption. I believe Christianity is true based on good reasons and evidence. That's what we do in Rosho Christi. But if Christianity is true, there's something I said tonight that I want to reflect on a little bit more. This will just take a minute or two. But earlier tonight, I said that you are not slaves to your desires. Do you remember that in the context of one of my arguments? I said that you're not a slave to your desires. Well, I, I said that tongue-in-cheek 
because there's a sense that the New Testament is true, and I believe it is, if it's really from God, and I believe it is, then according to the New Testament, there's a sense in which you are a slave to your desires. So I want to read some verses for you from Romans 7. Because there's, within Christianity, we have some real exciting hope here. Because there is a sense in which we are slaves to our evil desires. But Christianity can f free us. Jesus, not just Christianity, Jesus, God, can free us from those evil desires. So listen, I'm, I'm not going to put it on the board, but just listen to these verses from Romans 7. This is Paul writing. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm fleshly, sold into sin's power. For I do not understand what I'm doing because I don't practice what I want to do. I do what I hate. But if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law, God's law, that it's good. God's commandments are good. So now I'm no longer the one doing it, but the sin within me. For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there's no ability to do it. That's in the sense that we're slaves to our desires. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I don't want to do. Now, if I do what I don't want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but it's the sin that lives in me. So I discover this principle. This is Paul talking. I discovered this principle. When I want to do what is good, evil is with me. For in my inner self, I joyfully agree with God's law, His commandments, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, my flesh, my me, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched, what a wretched man that I am! Who will rescue me from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So earlier when I said that you're not a slave to your desires, clarifying if Christianity is true, there's a sense in which you are a slave, but you can be freed, and that's why earlier I was comfortable saying that you're not a slave to your desires, because there is a way for you to be free from your evil desires, and it is, according to the New Testament, through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus promised not only if you trust in Him, that you'll be forgiven of all your evil choices and welcomed into heaven, but also that He would give you the strength to resist your evil desires. So again, I believe Christianity is true, and I want to encourage anybody who's watching this to make that decision to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Not only will you be forgiven, according to the New Testament, welcomed into heaven, your eternal life with God, loving Him and loving others for all eternity, but He'll also, in this life, give you the strength internally, through the Spirit, to resist your evil desires, which we all have, including me. All right, I'm sorry things went so long tonight, but there was a lot to cover, and I wanted to get through it all, and we made it, finally. So I'll take some time for questions if anybody has any. Otherwise, I'm sure you guys would rather get to the conversations um, with each other and talk about some of these things. But do you guys have any questions that I could try to help with now before we break up? Or anybody watching live online? We do have one online. Um, but if anyone else has a question for that, go ahead and ask. So the question online, and this was back to when we were talking about um, challenging uh, someone who believes that uh, the source of meaning, truth, and morality comes from within. Uh, the question was this, uh, even if God is the source, isn't the choice to acknowledge this an internal one? Don't we have to internally believe in God for that to matter? Uh... I think I understand what they're getting at. I probably wouldn't use some of the, I probably wouldn't say it the way that you're saying it. Um, 
So yes, according to Christianity, right, your uh, forgiveness or your relationship with God is determined by your faith, your decision to trust. That's, you know, what the Bible teaches that faith is, is trust. Like, I trust my mechanic to fix my car. I trust my wife to be faithful with me. I trust Jesus to save me, to be my Savior. So in that sense, it's, um, according to the New Testament, our salvation, our forgiveness, our um, destiny in heaven, eternal life, is based on our choice to trust Him. I, I don't see that as, or I wouldn't describe that as an internal desire. I would see that more of a, as a choice. Um, and again, going back to my distinction that I think is helpful between our desires and our choices.